to just chop your stuff up. So uh, try, don't leave your bags on the seats so that other people can sit there, please. There's a lot of people that still need to sit down. You better go then. I mean, you should go get the access. When you come back, yeah, when you come back, I can introduce you. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. You can say good morning back. Okay, I'll say good morning. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so we've got a lot to talk about today. First, there's a little bit of logistics stuff. Uh, one thing is that I realized that I didn't really tell you much about the final project. And uh, rather than go through it now, I've got the, the draft, I guess, of the, of the guidelines is online now. And so you can go on the website and find that. I, didn't, I accidentally had previously posted the draft from 20, the guidelines from 2015. They're pretty similar, but the updated ones are on the website now. The other thing is that the wait, so uh, there's 80 people sign up for the wait list right now. And uh, that's, <clears throat> I'll probably let in more than 25, but that's more, I'm not going to let in 80. Um, but uh, make sure that you sign up on fri by Friday, because that's when I'll create the priority list to send to the academic office. And, um, and so some people will start getting let in uh, next week. The other thing is that, uh, and so by the way, like what happened with that is um, that the EC, well, so we created this section to, uh, as an override section, and it was supposed to be that the academic offices were to leave it closed, and then uh, somehow the EC academic office let in more people than was supposed to be in the override section to begin with, and I didn't realize it. So I know that it's really a pain for those of you who have registered for that section and then need to drop and hopefully get re-registered. Um, but I, I think that we'll be able to find something for you. Um, the other thing to note is that there's two highly related courses that, uh, that may also be attractive. EC418, Image and Video Processing by Pierre Moulin. And the other is uh, Topics in Image Processing, which is by Alex Schwing. Um, I know both of them. I would take a class with either one if I were trying to learn computer vision. And Alex is a new professor, um, just started this year. And I think that that class is still um, open for registration. I think it's not full yet. OK, so let's talk about the material now. So, um, so today we're going to talk about how pixels get their values, basically, and what that tells us about scenes. So this is. One of the, this is the most fundamental concept in computer vision. The way that an image is formed is that you've got some kind of light source, like the sun or light in a room. Light emanates from that source, and then it bounce off, bounces off of surfaces in the scene. It comes into the camera, and depending on the angle that it comes into the camera, it hits somewhere on the film or the sensor array. So with digital cameras, and we're typically working with, we're always working with digital images, um, the, uh, you replace the film that would have come on an older analog camera with the CMOS, typically, sensor array. So what that means is that instead of having a perfectly crisp uh, image of the objects in the scene, you have a rasterized image. Everything is broken down into little cells. And so what was a nice, clean curve there becomes a kind of blocky, um, a blocky image. So to go into a little more detail, this creates, uh, this creates a lot of challenges for computer vision. The rasterization, as well as other kinds of noise, and the complexity of the ways that light can get to the camera. 
So this is, a, this is an intensity image, a grayscale image. A raster image just means a matrix of values. Um, so in this case, the values will go from 0 to 1 if it's floating point, or 0 to 255 if it's a byte image. So it looks like, if you look at that sign, it looks like a really nicely painted or printed sign where you've got a white background with a solid black print on it. And in fact, that's probably the case. When you zoom into the image, though, you see that the image of it is actually a lot more noisy than it looks like to us. Even though we're looking at the image uh, from far away, we're kind of interpreting it as a nice crisp black pattern printed on a white sign. When you look at it in detail, you see that it's not a crisp pattern at all. There's, um, there's basically everything from what looks like black to white, and it's all blocky, and it's kind of all, all very splotchy. And when we look at the values of the pixels, so here one would be white and zero would be black, we can see that it's not even black on white. The, the darkest pixel there is around 0.34, which is sort of a mid-level gray. So it's actually kind of like a lowish gray to white. And the reason why it looks like it's black and white is because of the contrast. So today we're going to, oh yeah, so I also wanted to sorry, introduce Chu Hong. Chu Hong is the, third, uh, the other TA that I didn't get to introduce because she's often making sure that the, the recordings are working correctly. Okay. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, light and shading, what determines the pixel's intensity, and what can we infer about a scene from the pixel intensities. So, as I said before, uh, what happens is that you've got some light, it emits some rays, some of those rays bounce off the scene, and then they pass into the camera. And then the angle that they pass into the camera tells you where it will hit on the sensor array, the intensity of the light that comes into the camera is how bright the image will be. So there's a lot of different factors that determine the pixel intensity. One is the illumination strength. If, uh, you know, if, you're, if you've got a bright light, then, then you'll get more light coming into the camera. Um, the surface geometry, surfaces facing the light will uh, reflect more light than surfaces that aren't. Surface material, uh, if something's a dark material, it won't reflect as much light. Nearby surfaces with inner reflections and camera gain and exposure. So there's many different factors that contribute to the intensity. So how does light get reflected from surfaces? There's a couple of main ways, um, and these are kind of simplified models. So one is specular light, and this is the kind of reflection that we think of when we think of a mirror. So there, just light bounces off at the incident angle. Like if I'm shooting light at this direction on the wall, then it will bounce off at that direction only. And specular reflection, the, uh, what you observe depends on your viewing direction. Like if you move around a mirror, you see different things. The other kind of reflection is diffuse reflection, which is when light scatters in all directions. So if, if you think about cloth or um, I don't know, grass, cement, um, those are mainly diffuse reflection, and uh, the light is scattering everywhere, and so you observe the same intensities no matter where you are. So, uh, so what we often use as a, sometimes as a simplifying model for a material is something called a, a Lambertian reflectance model. That just means that some light is absorbed, depending on the albedo, if you've got a high albedo like snow, then a lot of light is reflected. If you've got a low albedo like this countertop, then a lot of light is absorbed. And then the remaining light is all diffusely reflected. So it's all just scattered in all directions. So cloth is an, a soft cloth is a good example of a Lambertian surface. So, and there's a nice property from, uh, from Lambert's cosine law that says that um, basically the amount of intensity that you observe coming off of a diffusely reflecting surface will be the same no matter what your viewing angle is. And that's because there's actually less light that's reflected at sharper angles. So light coming into the surface, more light will be reflected in this direction than, than off to the side but the surface area gets smaller as it's more incident to you. So if I'm looking at the surface from this direction, 
then a square inch will occupy a smaller part of my visual field than if I'm looking at it face down. And those two factors exactly cancel out. So as a result, the intensity per unit area that reaches my eye is the same no matter what my viewing direction is. And that's a really nice property because otherwise our visual, like our image of objects would be constantly changing as we move around them. You can imagine if everything was a mirrored surface, it'd be very confusing. So specular reflection isn't like that. It, um, the, light, the light that you see is only the light that came in at the incident angle. And a lot of surfaces are neither fully specular nor fully diffuse. So these are some examples. Anything like plastic or like a shiny wood surface. So here you can see with these plastic objects, let's see if my... So with these plastic objects, you see like all these little bright spots. Those are called specularities. Basically, a specularity is just, is just a reflection of a light source. So they're really bright in these spots because this is where the light source is reflecting. Um, so, uh, so you've got, it's specular everywhere, but where you see the reflection of the light source, the light source dominates rather than the diffuse component. The diffuse component of these will be like reflecting blue light or red light and so on. The specular component just reflects mainly whatever is coming in. So same with the wood floor. So you see that the wood is, the floor is brown. It's brown everywhere, even where, where it's white here. But the reason why you get this white uh, spot here is because the large amount of light that's coming directly through the window, the specular component there kind of uh, overrides or, or saturates out the signal that we're getting from from the diffuse reflection of the wood floor. So the amount of light that's reflected for, for, uh, diffu for, or the amount of light that's reflected off of a surface also, of course, depends on the amount of light that's coming into the surface per unit area. And, um, and so that means that the amount of light that a surface reflects depends on its orientation with respect to the light source. So you can think of it as like, you know, if somebody were like shooting bullets at you or something, you would want to stand sideways so that you've got less surface area and then fewer bullets would hit you, hopefully none. And if you, if you face front ways, then, a lot of, then you've got a lot of surface area exposed so a larger fraction will hit you. So same with light. If you, you've got these light rays that are uh, coming out from some light source, if the surface faces it directly, more light will hit it per surface area. More light in total will hit it than if the surface is, is uh, at an oblique angle to it. And so the equation for determining the amount of light that's reflected is this rho, which is 1 minus the albedo, times s, which is the direction of the, of the, uh, of the source. So it's a three vector. It's like an x, y, z direction. That's a unit norm times the, uh, this S is the, is the direction of the source times its intensity. So if it had an intensity of 1, then the length of S would be 1. If it has an intensity of 10, then the length of S will be 10. Times the normal of the surface. And this is just a unit vector. So, uh, I mean dot producted, sorry. S is dot producted with N. So if you do A dot, A, B dot, C, D, that's AC plus BD. So why is 1 darker than 2? Yes? Right, exactly. So 2 is more directly facing the light source. And 1 is not in shadow, but it's significantly darker than 2. We can see it's not in shadow because we can see the shadow right over here. Um, so, so there, the, um, because 2 is facing the light more directly, it's brighter than the part of the surface that isn't facing the light more directly. All right, so to recap that part, when light hits a typical surface, some light is absorbed. Uh, 1 minus rho of the light is absorbed. And more light is absorbed for low albedos. Some light is reflected diffusely. It's scattered in all directions. And that light will, you'll observe the same intensity of light no matter what your viewing direction is. And some light is reflected specularly, 
So there the light is bouncing off at the incident angle. And the light that you observe will depend on your viewing direction because it will change the incident angle. So there's also other possible effects. You can have transparency. Of course, the air is transparent. You can also have glass and other transparent materials or partially transparent materials. You can have refraction. So with the glass, the light coming in will uh, bend and then bend again. So whenever light enters a material that has a different refractive index, it will, it will change the angle of the light. Um, you can have subsurface scattering, and this is very common, uh, with, uh, especially with people. So your skin is not, a, is not like an impermeable surface. The light actually penetrates it, and then it reflects, bounces around, and comes back out. And so that's why if you blush, you've got more blood flow under your skin, of course. And so the more of the light is, uh, you know, that, that extra blood flow is reflected with the subsurface scattering. If you try to model a person and you just model them with, without subsurface scattering, it looks really fake, like a plastic doll. So uh, other, there's also more rare kinds. So there's fluorescence. Fluores fluorescence means that light comes in one wavelength and it comes out another wavelength. And phosphorescence, which means that light comes in, it sticks around for a while, and then it leaves at another time, so like with a glow stick or something. So, um, so this term is not like super, uh, we're not going to use it a lot, but it's important just to know what the term means because it might come up from time to time. And if you do graphics, you would get into this in a lot more detail. So there's this function called a bidirectional reflectance distribution function. And it just means that you model for every angle of light coming into a surface and every angle of light going out of a surface per wavelength, per like color of light, you model how much of that, uh, how much of that incident light goes out. So you can model specularities and diffuse reflections and more complicated reflections using a BRDF. So, um, so even with this little amount of information we know, we can do some kind of cool things like photometric stereo. So photometric stereo is a 3D reconstruction of a surface based on images that, based on the observation of that surface under different lighting conditions. So we can assume, for example, that we've got a set of points that are infinitely far away. So what that means is that all the rays of light that are coming into the surface from a single light source are coming from the same angle. That's, kind of a, that's an assumption of convenience. It's basically true if you had the sun, but it's not, true, it's not exactly true if you put like a big box around the object and put little point sources on it. But let's assume that. We'll assume we've got a set of pictures of an object that are obtained in, in exactly the same camera and object configuration. So imagine you just put a big box around an object You've got a camera inside it that's looking at the object, and you've got little LEDs that are on the corners of the box. And we've got a Lambertian object, or we've removed the specular component. And so, so the lights, different lights on the different corners of the box will create different images. So if all the lights are on, or if a top light is on, you might get this image. If the Right bottom, if the lower right corner light is on, then you get this image. If the upper left corner is on, then you get that image, and so on. So we can actually reconstruct the surface based on the intensities that are observed from these different light sources um, by just solving for the unknowns in this equation. So here we have that, the, uh, the equation that we showed earlier. We've got the source. Uh, the source is the direction and strength of the lights. The direction would be known. And the strength may be um, you know, something that we have to solve for. It could be constant among the lights. And then we take the dot product of that source direction and strength with rho, which is the amount of the percent of light that's reflected from the surface, times the normal of the surface. Right? We don't know what rho is, and we don't know what the normal is. Um, but we know something about the source direction and strength because we set up this box. And so that determines the intensity. So the intensity is what we observe, and we want to solve for the albedo and the surface normal. So we can solve directly for B, and then we can uh, figure out B. So um, 
So to do this solution, we would just set up a system of linear equations where we know i, we know the, uh, we know the normal of, um, of the source, and we could just say, we could just say that we're going to solve for the albedo relative to some constant factor if we don't know the intensity of the source. And then we have a known, a known, and then some unknown per pixel. So we have uh, four unknown variables per pixel, the albedo and the surface normal. And if we have four light sources, then we have four equations per pixel. And so four unknowns, four equations per pixel, we can solve it as a system of linear equations and, and then solve for, this, uh, solve for B. So even if we had three, actually, we could solve for B. So we get um, B is, uh, so B is rho times the normal. So once we solve for B, then we can get rho just by taking the, um, just by saying that rho is the length of B. Since, since B is rho times n, and n is a surface normal, a surface normal is a unit vector, meaning that its length is 1, or n dot n equals 1. And so once we have b, then we can get rho by just the length of b. And so the top here is showing the albedo that's solved for from those images. And this is showing the surface normal that's solved, for, for, that solved from those images. And then uh, a height map is created by integrating over the surface normals. So there's a simple problem in your homework that, that involves solving for the uh, orientation and uh, properties of a surface from light. It's just kind of more of a conceptual problem. So, um, so, so far we're not, so far we've just said, you know, what intensity, we've really talked about what intensity is coming into the camera. But, um, but that intensity will be transformed depending on the gain, uh, the shutter speed, and other uh, factors of the camera, right? So, um, so if we see, there's a, in the world, there's a huge dynamic range. Indoors, we might have uh, light coming in at, a, at a, a proportional to like 10 to the ninth. And then outdoor on a sunny day, it might be proportional to 10. So in other words, it's the light outdoors may be a trillion times brighter than a dark room indoors. And even the light outdoors may be, um, so comfortable indoor, indoor illumination is 10 to the negative 2. So light outdoors on a bright day is 100 times brighter than a nicely lit interior room. So there's a huge range in the amount of light that we see. Our eyes adapt to that by changing our pupil size, which changes the, basically our aperture, the hole that the light's coming in. And so we let more or less light in. And then also, uh, cameras can do the same. And also you've got the shutter speed, which, which determines how long you record light for. And you've got a gain factor. So, so cameras will be able to record changes with only some range of light determined by all those factors I just mentioned. And so that range of light will map into the values that are between, uh, say, 1 and, 1 and 254. And then all the, th all the values that are much brighter or much darker than that will map onto the extrema of the intensity range. So with the, the typical... Um, mapping of intensities to pixel intensities looks something like this. So you've got, it's pretty linear in the mid-range of the intensity values, meaning that if your intensity is 30, if you've got one intensity that's 30 and another that's 60 in the same scene, then the pixel that has a 60 intensity, probably twice as much light was hitting it. But it's nonlinear at the extrema. The, the range gets compressed so that it, you have a larger dynamic range of the camera, and you can still see some changes. So a pixel that has an intensity of 1 might be many times darker or many times less bright than a pixel that has an intensity of 2. And so that's called saturation. Once you get, once you get up past like 250, then things start getting saturated. Uh, once you get down really low, then it's undersaturated. Okay, so, um, so still we've only talked about intensities, just as if 
there's one color of light, one wavelength of light that's being sent everywhere, and we're just seeing grayscale images. We've only really dealt with grayscale images so far. But, um, but we see color. We see a range of wavelengths. So this is the visible spectrum. It goes from about 400 to 700. Um, does anybody know? So, well, there's one. So our peak, our peak intensity. So we're most sensitive to this like green range, around 550. Um, does anybody know like one reason why that's kind of a convenient range to be very sensitive to? Yes? Um, that's part of it. I mean, that's a good reason. Actually, we're, we're, I guess we not only are receptive to green, but we're very sensitive to small changes in green. And that's a good reason why we're small receptive, why we're sensitive to small changes in green. Um, there's another reason too. Yep. Maybe saturation or undersaturation goes green? Um, no, not so much. So, uh, so one of the reasons that it makes sense is that this is where the sun is, is giving a lot of power. So the sun is sort of like around here, uh, the main power of the sun. And so we're sensitive to, uh, we're sensitive to uh, areas where a lot of light is coming in from the sky. But there's also, there's also a lot of light coming in at these higher wavelengths where we're not sensitive. So there's infrared. I don't really know why we can't see infrared. Seems like it also might be convenient. But there's not really anything that's special about different wavelengths along here, except that these are the ones that we can see. So these are some examples of the spectra of light sources. So there's a ruby laser. It will look red. It's just got a single wavelength. There's a gallium phosphide crystal has a small range of wavelengths. A uh, light, tungsten light bulb is kind of like yellowish, and it, it has like, you know, full spectrum, but at different intensities with different wavelengths. And then daylight has a, a more um, uniform spectrum. So this blue is because of the scattering from the sky. So if, if you look at the sky with the sun in it, the sun looks yellow. And then the sky is blue, so there's a lot of light being, the scattered light gets a more, uh, more blue light is scattered. And so you can see that, like, there's kind of just a lot of power in this whole range that we're sensitive to. But then it starts to fall off. So um, this is also showing some examples of uh, the reflected light of different surfaces under white light. So one thing that's important, one uh, point I want to get across is that we tend to say like something is green or yellow or blue, but it's actually usually a whole range of wavelengths. And our perception of it as having a certain color is just kind of a summarization of the wavelengths that we observe. And, and of course, we're not actually observing all the wavelengths, as I'll get to in a moment. So... Um, uh, so like red is actually a range of reds. Yellow is actually green to red, but the center is yellow. Blue is, you know, again, a range where the center is blue. Purple, purple is actually like, on, in this case, on both sides of the spectrum. And, um, and so we, in, we, re in, we interpret these multidimensional signals as having a color and a brightness and an intensity. So here's just a bunch more examples of spectra. So one thing to note is that two, uh, it's possible for two things to have the same observable color, but to have different spectra, because we don't observe the whole spectrum. We don't have spectrograms in our head. So um, the color that you observe in an object depends both on the material of the object and on the light source. So the, the, you could have, you know, with this image, you could potentially generate a drawing. Uh, in fact, this is just a drawing on a white background, the slide that I'm projecting. You could just generate a drawing that has these colors, or you could have a white uh, surface that has lights that are, uh, lights of different colors that are projected onto that surface. 
right? And they would be identical. They would be, uh, you could produce the same pattern either way. So there's a conflation between the light that you observe coming from an object is both due to the color of the light source and the color of the object. And technically, it's not possible to distinguish between them, but there's a lot of tricks we can use to figure out, uh, to estimate the true colors. So people are very good at this. So getting back to images, the way that uh, images are recorded typically is that you've got this CCD that's just sensitive to all light, and then you put a filter on top of it, so only light of a particular color gets through. Um, so you've got uh, more, uh, you've got your red, green, and blue, so we're, we're observing light in three ranges of wavelengths, and uh, there's more green than there is red and blue. Does anyone know why there's more green? Um, yes? Science, if humans being more sensitive to green light, they want to do a cheaper way to see the image. Yep, that's pretty much it. So it's, so it's because we're more sensitive to green light. And, um, and so we want to, really what's important, as, I'll get, as I may uh, get to, uh, I think, in an, another lecture, is intensities. So in order to get the, the overall intensity of the light, getting green light is more valuable to us. Um, okay, so here's the, here's the image broken down into three channels. We've got the red image, green image, and the blue image. And one thing that's kind of interesting is that they all look almost the same. And that's because uh, it's pretty rare to have very bright colors or things that are really pure blue or pure, purely in the green range or purely in the red range. Even though the sky looks blue, you can see it has more blue. The blue intensity is higher. But there's also red and green in there. And this brick, I might call it red, but it's actually very close to gray. There's a lot of red and green and blue, just a little bit less blue. So um, another thing you might notice is that the uh, blue, the shadow is higher in blue than in red and green, even though the road is higher in, uh, even though the road is about even in all of them, maybe a little bit more red. The shadow is a little bit brighter in blue. So you might be able to, I'll just let you think about it, see if you can figure it out. I think I talk about it later, so, in another lecture. So if, um, all right, so light's this whole spectrum. So why do we capture it with RGB images? So if we have this whole range of wavelengths from like 400 to 700 that we're sensitive to, why is it that you can take an image, store three values, red, green, and blue, and then reproduce something that feels to us like it had that whole range of wavelengths? Does anyone have an idea? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So. We uh, humans have just three types of, three ranges of wavelengths that we sense as well, and then we interpret color from those. So we've got the long cones, which are red, the medium, which is green, and the short, which is blue. Short, short refers to shorter wavelengths, you know, like 450. Um, plus intensity rods that just measure overall intensity that tend to be uh, more active at night in our lower resolution. So, um, so we can, we only sense these, like, th these separate ranges and then kind of summarize some over those ranges. And so when we capture light in a camera that way and do some, just report the total light over these different ranges, then we can reproduce something that might be different than the original signal, but it would uh, make sense to us. It would look like the original signal to us. So there's other animals that have different numbers of cones. So like dogs have two, fish have four. Pigeons have five. So actually, images, RGB images, might look very different than the original scene to these other animals. Also, uh, there's, there's a bunch of interesting things about the, the way that we record light. So one is that the, uh, the medium and long cones are determined by the X chromosome. So that's why men are much more likely to be colorblind, because if there's something a little off there, then 
uh, you know, women have an XX, men have an XY, so if something's off on our 1X, then, then you may not perceive all the colors. And also, L has a high variation, so some women are, are tetrachromatic, which is like, if their two X's happen to have produced like very different um, long cone ranges, then they have more sensitivity to light because they basically got four ranges that they're sensing. So, um, so this is still only uh, part of the picture. So, so far we've talked about light comes in, it bounces off of a surface, and then it comes into the camera. But, and that's called a local illumination model. But actually light bounces off of a lot of surfaces before it hits our eye. So you can see here there's like light reflecting off of this green block, um, bouncing off the block onto the ball, and then off the ball into our eye. And so the ball looks green here, even though it's white, and it looks red here, and so on. So inner reflection is actually a really major source of light. There's no, you can't see a light source in here. There's no light on in the room, and you can't see the sun from, from where the camera is. But you can still see a lot of light inside the room. You can still like, make out most of the objects. And that's because the light is coming into the windows, bouncing off of these portions of the rug, and then bouncing off the other objects, and then eventually getting into the camera. So, uh, so, uh, so actually, like a really large portion of the light that we observe is through inner reflection, not just from light bouncing off, coming from the light source, bouncing off of one object, and then coming into the eye. So that, again, makes things more complicated. And as I noted that, uh, you know, the, this changes the apparent perception of objects. So it, the color of an object depends not only on the color of that surface and the color of the light source, but also on the color of the objects that are near it. So if you are in, you know, if you drive under like a, a really green area, if there's like a lot of trees and you drive, drive under a canopy of trees, then the light is getting filtered, but also there's a lot of uh, inner reflection. If you stand next to a tree, then your face will be kind of greenish from the light bouncing off of the tree and then bouncing off of your face into the camera. So I forgot to mention, but of course, uh, feel free to stop me with questions. I'm happy to answer anything about vision. <laughs> um, so. It's, there's, beyond inner reflection, there's also shadows, of course. So, uh, seeing surfaces cause shadows. A shadow is just a reduction in intensity due to a block surface. So, a little bit of shadow terminology. We've got some light source here, and we've got the shadowed, ob the object that's causing the shadow. The umbra of the shadow is the part of the shadow that's completely block that where the light source is completely blocked from view. So if the light source is like a non-infinitesimal, if it's not a point, so for example, for the, these like rectangular light sources, then a little object or some, some object may uh, block the complete light source from some positions on the surface, but it only block part of the light source from other positions on the surface. So the part where it's completely blocked is called the umbra, and the part where it's only partly blocked is called the penumbra. That's like the the part of the shadow that fades into the rest of the scene. So if you have a point source, then everything is just the umbra. You just get this really sharp boundary. So like with the sun, on a bright day, um, you get a sharp looking shadow. So because you've got the light that's coming directly from the sun will be completely blocked by, uh, will be blocked by uh, your silhouette causing a sharp shadow on the ground. And then you can still, though, see the color of the ground somewhat because there's still light coming in from the sky that will hit the ground where your shadow is. So, so with a point source, you get a sharp shadow. With an area source, you tend to get a more fuzzy shadow. The sky is a huge area source. So on a cloudy day, you won't really have a sharp shadow at all or any shadow. Um, 
So, so there's some different models of light sources that are important to keep in mind. One is that you can have a distant light source, classic example is the sun. The important thing there is that all the light that's coming in, you can think of it as coming in at a single angle. So like with that building, if that building were just like a completely blank surface, then, you, then you'd have one color on, or one intensity on one side of the building and one intensity on the other side of the building um, because all the light would be at exactly the same orientation or, or you know, close enough that we could treat it as exact. Where if I take a flashlight here and I, um, and I shine it at that wall, then different parts of the uh, wall will have different brightnesses even if the flashlight were like a, a perfect like cylinder of uniform light, um, because the angles would be slightly different to different parts of the surface. Or I guess I should say if a better image is if I took a flashlight and I go like, you know, I move it like this, then the intensity will change as I get more oblique. Um, Another important model for a light source is an area source. So like I said, the, the white walls are another area source. Walls reflect a lot of light. If you paint a room black, it'll be really dark. You know, even if you put in a thousand watts of lights in there, it'll still look pretty dark because all the light will just get immediately absorbed. Well, we usually make ceilings white and walls a lighter color so that a small number of light sources, like the light just bounces around until it does something useful. So um, the third is ambient light. So ambient light doesn't really happen. Um, ambient light is just that there's like light coming from everywhere. Of course, light comes from somewhere. But it's sometimes uh, convenient to say that we've got some point source uh, like the sun, plus there's just some general light around that is, um, that is causing you to observe the colors of an object, even if they're in shadow. So if you created a graphic scene and you only had a distant point source, then anything in shadow would be perfectly black, which isn't, which isn't typically true. And so you would usually minimally have like some point source or point sources, plus say that there's some ambient light. And then the final one is a global illumination model. So that's where you say, um, for example, that I've got like a little globe here, and I know all the light that's coming in to different angles inside this globe. So then you can model the inner reflections of the other objects. All right, so uh, let's recap. So why is 3 darker than 4 in terms of albedo, shadows, textures, specularities, curvature, lighting direction? Uh, I think somebody said it. Albedo? Yes, albedo. So, uh, three has a lower albedo than four, there, so you know that's the main cause. And why is one darker than three? Right, it's in the shadow of the glass. And why is this bright spot on two brighter than the glass around it? Right, it's a specularity. So, so, um, so there's a. Actually, it looks like there might be more than one light source. So you can see, you can figure out from these specularities potentially, if you can estimate the angle of the glass, where the light sources are in the scene. Okay, so now we get back to our first question, which was, or I guess we can summarize our first question. What does the intensity of a pixel tell us? I guess we're sort of trying to turn it around now. So we said, how does a pixel get its intensity? Now let's say that I know that this intensity, the image at row 234, column 452, has an intensity of 0.58. What does that tell me about the scene? So I won't have people hazard a guess because unfortunately the answer is that a pixel's brightness tells us absolutely nothing by itself. And that's because it's determined by way too many different things. So it's the plight of the poor pixel that it just doesn't have very much information. It has a single number, and that number is determined by the light source, strength, direction, and color, by surface orientation, by the surface material and albedo, by the, um, 
the re reflected light and shadows from surrounding objects and by the properties of the camera itself. So it's kind of like if I tell you, you know, I'm summing up eight different numbers and the sum is equal to 457, what are those different numbers? There's no way you can tell me. So, uh, so as an example, if we look at like little patches here, we can see with our amazing vision interpretation systems that this is a white and black shirt with white and black stripes. This we would interpret as all being the same color, and this we would interpret as all being the same color, or same albedo. Um, but actually, um, if you look at this part of the white surface and this part of the black surface, they actually have, I mean, all of these examples have very similar colors. So the, white, the, black, the shadowed part of the white surface and the brighter part of the black surface are about the same intensity. Similarly, the sidewalk is lighter than the asphalt, but the shadowed part of the asphalt has the same intensity as the, I mean, the shadowed part of the sidewalk has the same intensity as the asphalt. So there's an inherent ambiguity there. Just telling you the intensity doesn't tell you how bright a surface is, it doesn't tell you how light the light source is, it doesn't really tell you anything by itself. So here's one more example. You've got um, so the woman's wearing a suit, we'd assume, assume it's a uniform color, but if you look at the shoulder of the suit, it's a lot brighter than the pant leg of the suit, and in fact the ceiling, which will be almost white, it's a light gray probably, is about the same intensity as the shoulder of her suit, which is a black suit. But, in spite of all that, um, you know, a pixel tells us nothing, but a whole group of pixels obviously tells us a lot. So we can interpret images. You know, any pixel individually has virtually no information, but groups of pixels can tell us a lot about the scene. Otherwise, images would be useless to us, and our vision would be useless to us. And so the key idea is that for nearby scene points, most of the factors don't change very much. You've got the same light sources, the same objects are nearby, same materials, and so the only change might be due to, say, surface orientation. Or if you're at the boundary of an object, the change might be due to, like, a material of a different, of a different object. So what that means is that the information of the image is not really contained in the overall intensities of the image, but in the local differences of brightness. That's what tells us about the scene. So as an illustration, um, this is a, uh, here I just took the gradients, which means the difference of neighboring uh, pixels, and made it so that when you have a strong difference, it's going to appear as darker than if you have a small difference. And you may not have ever seen an image that looks like that before, but you can still interpret it, even though it doesn't look like a natural image. You would still say, I think anybody would be able to say that this is a telephone pole and telephone wires and a tree, in buildings and a road. So just to show you that, in this case, you already saw that image, so it's kind of cheating. So you already knew what it was. But I bet you can also interpret this image, which you might not have seen before. And you probably haven't seen anything like this in a natural scene. So, so what is this? Yeah, so it's some kind of uh, lion cougar thing chasing a zebra on a motorcycle, right? So there's the, there's the color image. But you get, even from this like super impoverished scene, this is very impoverished because you have no color information, no information about the overall intensity. If I added a thousand to the original pixels, nothing would change. But you still get about the same information that you get from this. It just looks less vivid. So, um, so the important part of images is not the intensity themselves, but the d local differences of intensity. So um, in particular, local differences of intensity tell us a lot about the shape. And that's because, uh, uh, mainly because um, changes in the surface normal will change the observed intensity. Because you change the surface normal, that means that the, the direction of the light coming in with respect to the surface normal changes. So for example, you can see, if I did a plot of a line going across this pillar, you would see that it starts as very bright 
around here, and then it gets darker and darker and darker, and then it gets in shadow. Um, so you get like this, you can tell that it's round from that. Where here you just get a sharp edge because it's, it's a corner of two flat surfaces. It's bright here and it's dark here. You've also got texture, which are little like micro changes in, in surface normal, and, and those show up for the same reasons. Um, it can tell you about, um, it, you can see like indents and bumps, you can see grooves and crease, creases. You can also see uh, when um, one light, when, when an object is close to the ground, for example, with cast shadows. So uh, shadows are another important cue. So you've got like changes. If you can detect shadows, then it can tell you a lot about the shape of an object. So one of the major cues is, is, is local changes of intensity. Another cue, which is not really used as much in computer vision because it's hard to figure out where the shadows are in the first place, but still useful is shadows. What, what people are really sensitive to with shadows is the presence of a shadow. So if you try to draw a ball on the ground, but you don't put a shadow by the ball, then people will feel like the ball is floating. If you put the shadow there, then suddenly people know that it's attached to the ground. And, uh, and uh, people, for, for creating games, people study, or I don't know if just creating games, but people study what are people sensitive to with the shadow. They're actually not that sensitive to the shape. So in a lot of games, you'll see like some character will like jump and there's just a little ball of a shadow under them. And we don't really care, even though it doesn't really look, it's not the shape that their shadow would make. It tells us that they're above the ground at this position. So, so we use shadows to tell us like if, if things are hovering above the ground or how close they are to some surface. But we're not super sensitive to the shape of the shadow. And I think that's partly because the shape is really complicated. It's a 2D projection of, of, of the, some silhouette of the object from some angle. So here's some shadow terminology. We've got the attached shadow. That's the part of the shadow that's on the object still, but it's blocked from light. You've got the cast shadow. That's the shadow that the object creates on another surface. And uh, shadow volume is the area of the 3D space that's in shadow due to that object. And then a shadow boundary is where you transition from being not in shadow to shadow. So that can actually tell you, um, potentially can tell you a lot about shape. People are really good at, uh, at, at determining albedo even though it's technically a very ill-posed problem. You've got too many, uh, too many different variables to really solve for what is the true color of a surface, but people are pretty good at saying that this is a fairly dark gray on a, on a light gray, right? That this is a light gray surface, this is a darker gray surface, this is like a reddish surface, and so on. And uh, it's actually a really hard problem. If you try to write a, a vision algorithm to estimate albedo, it's hard. People still can't do it. It's a hard thing to do. So one, one, source, of, one, uh, one source of constancy that we have is local comparisons. So you don't really, both people, uh, people and computers as well, uh, don't really focus on the absolute value of the RGB coordinate, of the RGB value. Um, they look at contrast, local contrast. So, for example, if you look at this, this looks like a kind of an orange, this looks like more of a brown, and so, you know, th this X looks different than that X, but then if you look down here, you can see that actually it's the exact same color. It's just the background that changes. So we don't really perceive the absolute color, we perceive the color relative to the background. And that makes it so that uh, we can be robust to like different light sources and um, different overall changes to a scene that don't really change the different illumination changes to a scene that don't change the properties of the scene themselves. Here's another example. So here you've got this looks like brown on red, this looks like red on brown, um, but they're actually the same. If you can like try to block out the bigger areas around them, they're actually the same color. And this one is my favorite example. I have to actually switch to my slide. So, um, all right, so we've got a checkerboard pattern. So first, 
which, uh, which albedo is lower, the block that A is in or the block that B is in? A. A, right. So A is definitely the albedo is lower. It's a darker patch. And which of the intensities is lower? So almost always the answers to these is it's the same. So I almost like don't want to ask anymore. But yeah, so, so it's the same. But when I look at it, I can't really make myself even though I know it's the same, and if I were sitting in your seat, I'd be like, oh, it's a trick question. It's probably the same. But it's hard for me to see that B is the same as A. And so I like to take, um, see if I can get, oh, wait. Oh, they're all attached. Wait, OK, let me go over here. <laughs> let me take this B, and if I drag it over the B, now, you know, now it looks white. And then I drag it over the A, and now it looks dark. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just dragging it. I'm not changing the color. But it somehow magically looks like that patch is changing in color as I move it through different portions of the scene. So that's a, from Ted Adelson, who's a um, professor at MIT. It's a great illustration. So, um, so what's happening there? We've got... So we know, so we're doing like a lot of unconscious processing there, a lot of unconscious in, uh, interpretation. So there's an object here, there's a light source over here, the object is casting a shadow, the shadow explains why this would be darker than that, and so we don't actually perceive what are the intensities, we actually perceive the albedo, even though it involves solving for some kind of like complicated physics problem, right? So you don't even think, like, you don't look at this and think, oh, yeah, like, you might not even think, oh, this is in shadow. You just think, like, oh, there's a cylinder here that's sitting on top of this block. And you don't think about the light being, source being over there, but somehow you're using it to resolve this uh, ambiguity. So there is some very simple color correction that we can do. Um, and uh, sometimes this is helpful for like balancing your images. And the simplest kind of color correction is just to separately balance the R, G, and B channels. So for example, you can, you can assume that maybe the brightest thing in the world is white, and then use that to get the ratio of the red, green, and blue channels, and then multiply by those inverse ratios. Another one that tends to work better, unless you unless you know, so you could that makes sense if you put like a, you could put like a white square in a scene that you want to balance. Color balancing could be especially important if you're trying to like take pictures of your house or your wall to try to see like what the current color is. If you ever try doing that, you'll probably notice that you take a picture of it and then it like turn. Then when you look at the picture, you're like, oh, that's not really the color of the wall at all. So you need to do some kind of color balancing. Um, so another way to do this is to assume that the image is on average gray. That sounds like it's a bad assumption. Like if you look at this room, there's like many different colors, mostly due to your clothes in this room. But if you look at the average intensity of the R, G, and B channels, it'll actually be pretty close to gray, like almost all the time. So, uh, so you can say that, okay, I'm going to assume that on average the world is gray, and then you multiply the R, and then you can like divide the, the uh, or multiply the R channel by, that sounds a little, that looks a little backwards to me. So I think you would divide the R channel by the average of R over the average of R, G, and B. And then if you do that for each of the channels, then after you're done with it, then the average color of R, and the av I mean the average intensity of R and the average intensity of G and B will all be the same. And then, uh, Another way, which I just said before, was to use some kind of reference, so for white balancing. Okay, so that was a lot to cover. We talked about the, um, the different factors that cause a pixel to get its color, and the factors due to the light source, due to the surface orientation of objects with re respect to the light source, and the surface intensity. Um, we talked about how uh, how you can actually, you know, a pixel by itself doesn't really tell you anything because 
it's due to a combination of too many factors, and you can't disentangle them. But if you get a lot of pixels together, and you can make some assumptions, like that nothing has changed except for, say, surface orientation, then you can actually solve for some of the seen properties. And so there's some important terms to remember. Um, diffuse and specular reflectance, you know, generally if that's mentioned, it'll be assumed that you know what that is. Albedo, which is the, uh, for albedo you actually have, albedo is a function of wavelength, so I forgot to mention that. So um, something that's red has a, has, is reflecting more light in the red spectrum than in the other part of the spectrums. So, um, so albedo is a function of lambda or wavelength. Um, and then the umbra penumbra, which are the shadow terminologies. Umbra is like the darkest part of the shadow where it's totally blocked from the, from the light source, and penumbra is where it's only partly blocked. Um, it's also important to remember that objects cast light and shadows on each other. So a lot of what we observe on the intensity of one object is actually due to the surrounding objects. If you put a white ball on a green room, it'll look green. If you put it in a red room, it'll look red. And, uh, and in order to interpret shape, what we care most about are the local differences in the intensity. So that can tell us about the surface orientation. It can tell us about the, like the 3D texture on the object. And, um, and it's basically our main cue for interpreting the scene. So, uh, so next class, we're going to cover how to extract these local differences in a variety of ways using image filters. And so that will be the start of our understanding of image processing, which is the root of scene understanding. Thank you.